Thanks. Yeah, so um, today I'm going to talk about Java, a new Java attack uh, vector um, deserialization. Um, it's something in, in Java that's um, been around for a while, but um, last year became a bit more popular, and uh, we've seen a lot of exploits come out in the last year about it. So a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer from Red Hat. Um, I work in the product security team there. Uh, I, before that, I spent five years in JBoss technical support, and I was a Java developer before that. Um, I've written a book about JBoss EAP6. Um, it's actually a series of uh, a webcast. Um, it was a lot of work, didn't get paid a lot, but at least I learned a lot about JBoss while writing it. <laughs> Good learning experience for you, I recommend, to write a book. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is Java serialization and deserialization. <laughs> How does this particular exploit work? And this is so slow. Um, how to determine if your application is vulnerable or not. Uh, so I'm talk about some JBoss EAP6. Well, in order to explore the vulnerability more, I want to um, demonstrate how we, how we investigated it for JBoss EAP. And both EAP 6 and 5. And how do we protect ourselves from this vulnerability? So let's get started. Oh, before I start, is there, is there any, um, how many people are de Java developers in the cr crowd? Oh, quite a few. That's good. And um, I guess the rest of you are people that, uh, sysadmins, are the sysadmins, that kind of thing? A uh, few more. OK, cool. And uh, how many of you have used, used JBoss at your organization? A few. OK, cool. So what is uh, half of you who are Java developers, this will be um, really basic, but for the other half, it might be interesting. So uh, what is um, Java serialization? It's taking an object, a Java object, turning it into binary, and then restoring it back to an object. Uh, and you may want to do this to save it to the disk or transfer it across a network. So if you are transferring it across a network, that's obviously a pretty bad attack vector because people Attackers can send things over the network for you to deserialize. So let's have a look at this object which we want to uh, serialize. And the code that we need to actually serialize it looks a bit like this. Uh, we have an object output stream and we write it, in this case, to the disk. And then when we want to bring it back as an object, we read from the disk and um, restore it as an object. So basically, this bit of code is kind of what you want to look for in your application to tell if you're vulnerable. So how does the exploit work? Uh, it uses this thing called a gadget chain. Now this is kind of unique and cool, so I spent a bit of time talking about this in the talk. It's the most technical part. So don't let your right. Don't give up on me yet. <laughs> uh, it gets easier from here. So it's a code reuse attack. And it relies on code that you've already got loaded in your application. So an attacker can't run anything that you haven't already included on your, in your Java application. It uh, creates a chain of objects in order to, oh, we skipped a few points. Come on. So it starts with a, a kickoff gadget, which starts the chain of objects um, being created. And then it ends with a sync gadget, which actually does the target operation that the attacker wants to do. And usually that's a, a system, uh, Java calling system runtime exec. Uh, so at the end of the uh, chain, what you're um, executing is something on the system as the, as the user running Java. So if you're running your Java application as root because you want to bind to point 80 or something, this could be really bad. So don't do that. Yeah, so let's have a look at an example gadget chain. Um, so there's an object in the, in the Java runtime, the standard library, called bad attribute value, value ex, uh, exception. And uh, it can be used to chain objects together, like create a new object to get to your target object. And uh, the target, most of the time, is runtime exec, as I mentioned. 
So the reason that um, bad attribute value expression can be used to create another object is it has this read object method, which if you're a Java developer, you might be familiar with it. It's a method that can run during serial deserialization in order to run some specific code. That was unexpected. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, so it's called during deserialization and uh, allows you to create an object of the attacker's choosing. Um, it, it wasn't designed to be used that way, but it just happens that um, some freaks figured out you could use it that way, and it's not good for your, um, the safety of, a Java, of your Java application. Um, so this is kind of what uh, a full chain looks like. This is an example of one uh, that's uh, available in a kind of um, attacker's toolkit to exploit this kind of vulnerability. The chains are quite long, and uh, Chaining them together can get quite complex. At the end of the day, what you're trying to do is basically create objects in order to get to that runtime exec to call your system command. Yeah. So I'll summarize this by saying if you, you've set up deserialization, you're expecting to get some kind of uh, Java object to create you know, your business logic. But an attacker is able to kind of circumvent that and say, no, I want to call runtime exec instead. Not very cool. OK, so there's a, there's a tool, this tool uh, kit called Why So Serial, which um, uh, Hoffman and uh, I forget the other guy's name, they, uh, they Hoffman uh, has got this GitHub repository. There's a link to it there. And uh, it's a great uh, tool kit for creating these gadget chains. It's very easy to use, and uh, it's basically a script, script kitty tool. So, if you are deserializing things, be careful. <laughs> so how to determine if you're vulnerable or not. So in order to create these gadget chains, uh, the, the toolkits uh, are using these popular libraries because they know that people have got them deployed all over the place. Um, so Commons Collections is maybe one that you've heard of if you've got any familiarity with this um, vulnerability. Uh, but there's also lots of other ones, including lots of ones from JBoss. Unfortunately. Uh, so let's have a look at the actual um, target code that attackers are going for or what you need to protect. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are using de deserializing things, then this is the kind of code that you need to look for. Uh, object input stream read object. And so how do we find this code? Um, one way to do it is to actually run your application. Like um, you, maybe you've got a performance suite or a test suite that you can run. And uh, while you're running that, that test suite, you can uh, run this Java agent, which will uh, print out a stack trace of um, whenever deserialization occurs in your application. And from the stack trace, you can um, figure out which which path through your code goes to the deserialization and try and figure out whether you can get in via the network or maybe in via the disk or something to that code. Uh, and you can also configure this, this tool, not so serial, to reject the deserialization when it happens. Oops. Yes, there's the link to it. Uh, so I, I did a video here, but I don't think we have time for it. Um, you can watch this later if you're interested. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, vulnerability 3737 in um, the JBoss operations network, which is a monitoring tool that JBoss uh, have for monitoring Java applications. Uh, and I, I, in this video, I demonstrate how I found this particular vulnerability. So you can watch that later. So now I'm going to talk a bit about like how these particular vulnerabilities and how they affected JBoss AP5 in order for you to get an idea of how you might find it in your application. Uh, so JBoss EAP5 was an interesting case because it, it's kind of beyond the support period now, so we don't have to worry too much about fixing it. Uh, but uh, the legacy invoker servlet was basically a servlet, uh, an endpoint that just kind of hangs out there uh, and deserializes things to sent to it over the network, which is exactly what you don't want. <laughs> uh, and also in EAP5, 
um, all of the libraries that are on the file system or the jars or the Java libraries are basically when the um, Java JBoss EAP5 boots up, all those jars become available on the class path. So that gives an attacker a smorgasbord of all the gadget chains they can create. And a lot of them can be found in that YSO serial um, script kitty toolkit. Uh, these are the ports that JBoss EAP5 opens when it, um, when it starts up. Hopefully you've got a firewall blocking access to these ports. Uh, but one of them in that, in that list, extensive list, is this actual legacy invoker servlet. That one. And all you have to do is, you know, serialize something to the disk and then send it to that port and boom. You can create, you run the system command of your choice. And the, the mitigation for that one is just to remove that servlet because we don't really know why it was there anyway. It's so old. <laughs> uh, for EAP6, these are the, this is a more modern um, version of EAP. Uh, 7 is the current version, and a lot of people are still on 6. We still support that. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there was a few different vulnerabilities in this version, and we take this more seriously because it's our current version. Um, so the uh, part of the JMS spec, is everyone familiar with JMS? It's a messaging spec, part of the Java EE. Uh, is that you can do object message, you can send object messages, which is exactly like, it's deserializing objects. Um, to me, this is a flaw in the spec, but what can we do about it? It's pretty old now. I don't know. Um, but all we can do really is we have to maintain this functionality in order to meet the spec, but we can kind of try and mitigate the risks around it. Uh, Matthias Kaiser um, alerted this, us to this vulnerability. Uh, so I drew a little picture of what happens here. In a messaging system, you, in a JMS, you have a middleware, which is like JBoss, and you have a JMS queue, and a producer and a consumer. Producer sends messages, and a consumer consumes them. So if a producer sends a message through the middleware to the consumer, uh, then it's the consumer that's actually going to uh, deserialize it, and uh, that's where you'll get your um, vulnerability happening. I'm just going to drive from here because it stopped working for some reason. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in this case, deserialization happens in the message consumer. And the gadget chain must, in that case, the code from the middleware doesn't actually get used to create the, the gadget chain. So all those, one, the target library that you want to create the gadget chain with, thanks, it has to be in the consumer. Uh, but there's also another way to exploit it on the middleware is if you have a message-driven bean. So in that case, it's a bit more serious. They can, a bit more choice of libraries they want to choose from. Uh, so the way to mitigate this is, uh, you know, to, to trust your producers, to make them authenticate when they send messages. And this is on by default in EAP 6 and 7, so that's a good mitigation. Oh yeah, so the other way to um, prevent it is, oh, well, to mitigate it is to, to have a trusted list of uh, objects which you can um, expect to be sent to you. So if, the, if it, an attacker tries to send an object to you which you don't know about or you don't trust, then you can just whitelist and say, no, I'm not gonna deserialize that. Uh, but you have to know what you're expecting and you have to configure this. If it changes, it's a, it's a lot of work. You can also do a blacklist if you want to. Um, and not so serial has that built into it if you want, but it's not very secure. Uh, this one is a much more interesting one, I think. Uh, it's about it's an attack on the JBoss clustering system, which is a way to um, uh, I explain it in my next slide. So let's move on. Uh, yeah, so JBoss clustering is usually used to share, share um, HTTP session data between two or more JBoss instances. Uh, and so usually you deploy, you know, a um, multi, uh, a high, highly available JBoss uh, setup like this with two JBoss instances behind uh, a firewall, HTTPD or something, and replication is the sharing of the HTTP session data. So uh, uh, JBoss clustering works by sending UDP traffic between the nodes 
And um, so in order to exploit this particular vulnerability, you had to be able to send a UDP packet to the JBoss instance, which usually means that you have to be on the internal network. Um, so exploiting it remotely was, is, can be difficult. But um, some people do do uh, JBoss clustering over a wide area network, and we have a, a setup to do that uh, using TCP. And if that, and you're doing that, then uh, you're definitely vulnerable to this kind of exploit. But if you're not using the clustering features, then you don't have to really worry. Yeah, so uh, JBoss had some authentication things, and we, and the, you would think that, okay, well, if, if we're trusting what the producers, are, uh, the message senders are sending, then we don't have to really worry about this exploit, right? We trust uh, our, everyone that's sending messages. But it turns out authentication only worked when a new member tried to join the cluster, or um, it's not actually checked when any type of message is received. And um, it, uh, JBoss clustering supports encryption, but that doesn't prevent replay attacks. So the other thing, interesting here, thing here was that um, JBoss actually uh, overrid the, well, extends the uh, deserialization mechanism, uh, over, uh, extends object input streams, so the object input stream class is not exactly the one we're looking for. There's one that's extended the functionality. That may be the case in your applications too. Um, so a little bit about how this worked. This is kind of like the JGroup stack, what it, clustering stack, what it looks like in the configuration, all the different, um, so when a message comes in, this is kind of um, taken from the top down. First it does the UDP protocol and then it does all the things as it processes the message. I've got a picture of this. Message comes in, UDP protocol takes the message off the network and starts processing it. And it just so happens that the deserialization happens very early in that stack. So in order to exploit this, I, didn't, I haven't got the full exploit here just in case any nasty people get it, but it kind of works by just putting a packet onto the UDP network and sending a malicious object in. So it was very easy to exploit if you're on the network. Yeah, so um, I'll talk a little bit about how to find this to summarize. Um, I think I've got about five minutes left, right? Yeah, so um, you, the white box method of, of finding this is if you have the code itself, you grep the code looking for the particular Java call object input stream read object. Uh, and yeah, um, the other, the other thing that you can do if you're able to run the code in a kind of controlled environment is to uh, install the Java agent, run your performance test or your, um, your other test harnesses, and uh, it'll print stack traces when deserialization occurs and you can narrow down on where it's happening. And you can use Not So Serial to do that, which is kind of all pre-canned and ready to go. Uh, or you can use Byteman, which is a JBoss uh, Java agent thing that we like to use at, at Red Hat. Um, I wrote an article about that in our knowledge base. I don't know whether that's public or for customers, I can't remember. So um, if you're interested though, ask me. Um, so how can I deliver a malicious payload? Uh, so this is for an, an, an attacker. Uh, yeah, so if you can white box test the, the, like so if it's JBoss, it's a publicly available thing, you can test it first in a controlled environment. Then you can generate a uh, malicious payload using Wiser Serial. And you can send that to the application and yeah, make some money or extort people. Um, or you can email Red Hat and uh, let us know about it and uh, we'll acknowledge you in our CDE database if you're more of an uh, ethical person. Uh, so in order to do the, the gadget chains, uh, they have to have one of these libraries on the class path. These are the ones that are well known now. Um, and you can view a list of them at this URL in the Wiser Serial project. Um, this is kind of more about that John video, so if you're interested in attacking uh, without having a white box, a black box method, uh, you can kind of look for deserialization on the wire. If you, if you look at the, um, the messages being sent over the network, deserialized code looks something like this in hex. Um, so how can we prevent it in general? 
is don't use Java deserialization because uh, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> um, prefer some other um, object um, uh, notation like um, JSON Java object notation. Um, and if you must deserialize, then trust your producers, add authentication to your endpoints, whitelist if you don't trust your producers, and um, restrict the classes that you have on your class pass so there's less options for attackers to create these um, gadget chains. I'll just go through the kind of the mitigations that we did for our, those particular vulnerabilities. Um, Yeah, so for that particular one, that interesting one, I found 2141. Uh, the, the, the thing there was that you need to actually, for our fix to work, you need to configure authentication when you, when you set up clustering. So there's a few extra steps with that one. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Any questions? <laughs> Got a question over here. Down the front here, on the right. Thanks. So I guess the first question is, why are people still using Java serialization instead of JSON? Yeah, um, well, I guess it's, it's a bit faster, maybe, to, to more efficient, perhaps, to use uh, serialization easier. Um, but yeah, maybe just because they had l legacy applications that they haven't upgraded yet. But yeah. So is, it, is that just a generally good fix, just throw away the Java serialization and switch to JSON? I know I did. Definitely. Yeah, okay, that's good. definitely the way to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no one else? Well, thanks everyone for your time and listening to me. See you, see you around.